the same thing realistically, even though they both deal with numbers. Yeah, I think that's something that, and I wish that our, I wish that our K through 12. Sorry, guys. (laughs) So uh, we are, we have not been streaming live for the last 30 minutes. We have not. Okay. (laughs) Oh my God. Amazing. I don't know. I thought, you know, I clicked on the link at one point and I was like, oh, my link's not working because it says that we're not live yet, but people are still talking and no one had said, where are we? Yeah, no, I'm like, what? Oh my God, this is so bad. <gasps> oh my God. I oh am no. so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> well, I, I can't. Oh my God. All right. Well, we're, we're all uh, warmed up. We're all warmed up. <laughs> we are all warmed up. We're ready to go. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. Um, all right. Well, I guess I'll give another introduction and recap this. Um, Hanel, we're, we're going to hear all about your experience. Okay. okay. Well, we'll, We'll go back around. Okay, well, welcome everyone. This is the most mortified I've ever been, maybe. Um, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we've been talking for 30 minutes and I was like, man, people must not be excited about our chat because no one's talking about it in the chat. No, we just were not. Okay, anyway, um, welcome. It was on purpose. Yeah, right. We just wanted everyone to become friends. I am so sorry, but... Welcome. Uh, our guest tonight is Hanalor Girling Dunsmore, who is here with her two perfect dogs, Tyr and Sven. And it is fuck. Is it Sven's birthday? It's Tyr's birthday. I cannot believe I've forgotten this. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> all right. It is Tyr's birthday. Um. Thank you all for being here. Please stick around. <laughs> Hanalor is awesome. Imogene is awesome. And I should never have my own show. Yep. Okay. <laughs> You do amazing, Serafina. <laughs> okay, Hanalor, please tell us what you do and t- tell us how you got interested in it. I know that'll now be an excuse to ask you more questions. All right. Well, my name is Hanalor Gerling Dunsmore. I am a PhD student in astrophysics at CU Boulder. I did my undergrad in physics and math at University of Maryland, and then I did my master's in physics at Caltech. And I study how the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies grow and fuel the outflows that we observe. (laughs) What are outflows? What does that mean? Yes. So, okay. um, Outflows in general are basically any kind of radiation coming from a source. What's radiation? And so radiation, radiation is like photons, neutrinos, really high energy particles. Um, that like, you know, are, well, they're in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so I don't know if that was a useful thing to say. Uh, but yeah, no, that is helpful. That is helpful. Yeah. And so what's really, really cool is that, so every massive, every normal galaxy, every massive galaxy, every, everything besides like these itty bitty tiny dwarf galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center. And a supermassive black hole is a black hole that has mass greater than about a million solar masses. And which is a bonkers number, by the way. Wait, Just like, uh, how big? Uh, oh, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. A million solar masses or larger. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're What's big. the solar mass of the Earth? Oh, oh, gosh. Good. I don't. The, the Earth is tiny. The Earth is okay. so little. The Earth is like, I don't even know. I know that the, um, I believe the sun is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Yeah, 10 to the 30 is right. Yeah, because it's 10 to the 33. It's 10 to the 33 if it's in um, in grams. So yeah. Yeah, I have no way to verify this. (laughs) <laughs> that's cool though but i just put it in context of how yeah. big what you just said the, is that's the, wild the, the earth is tiny like the earth is an itty bitty baby um yeah no these these things are enormous um and they get up to like 
30 billion times the mass of the sun. Like, I think that's one of the biggest that we've, that we've seen. Like there, it's, like these are not, this is the point where like the numbers mean nothing. Then like, you're just right. like, oh yeah, big. It's yeah. Big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like, what's really incredible. So hmm? cheers to black holes. Oh yes, we can cheers to black holes. All right. <laughs> cheers guys. Cheers, cheers. for saying, I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, it's fine. It's great. We're all warmed up. We're comfortable. We're, we're chatty. It's great. We're doing awesome. So, okay. So at the center of all of these galaxies, we have these supermassive black holes. Some of them, like Sagittarius A star, which is the one at the center of the Milky Way, isn't, they're not actively growing. They're sort of just hanging out. Just like, yes. Why, why, why are there supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies? <laughs> oh it's important sam you don't know something kids <laughs> <laughs> no i mean like so when i make that face it means we don't know so that's a very active area of research um it seems like it seems like galaxy formation is contingent on forming around a nascent supermassive black hole so one that maybe isn't supermassive yet but is on its way to becoming that. But we actually don't know how supermassive black holes form. And there's a few different ways that we think that might happen, but we can't really know how galaxies form until we, well, I mean, we know a lot about how galaxies form, but we don't know the very initial parts of that until we know how supermassive black holes form. Because oh. we found, hmm? Sorry, I, I've, I've no, so good. And part of this is because I'm an astronomer. Part of this is because I don't know anything about these things. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask about questions. Um, so I know that black holes form from really massive stars, right? Massive stars explode as yes. supernova and then create black holes. That gives us stellar massive black holes. Yes. Okay. So, so yes, right, right, right. But so my question is, there's a limit to the mass of a star, right? Like we can't have billion solar mass stars. So how do we yes. have billion, 30 <laughs> billion solar mass black holes? I'm so glad Because the that. universe is expanding. I heard that on Drunk Science once. <laughs> <Our guest team>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm so glad you asked. We actually have no idea how supermassive black holes form. We've got a few different, um, oh no, Sven is convinced that this is abuse because he pushed a Kong away from his own reach. Oh no. Um, so he did this to himself. Uh, so there's a few different ways because you're completely right. Um, we, the maximum mass we think we can get from, well, oh my God, I was about to say something that I realized was completely jargony. So I'm going to start over. So the very first stars in the universe are called population three stars. They're called population three because the populations were labeled in the order that they were found okay. <laughs> that, they, that they were like realized okay yeah i mean so they they realized that population three stars were a thing after population one and population two that's why they're population three even though it doesn't really make sense chronologically in the sense of the universe because oh, these were the first stars we, hmm? we are so bad we are so garbage at it we are literally the worst no one should ever let astronomers name anything <laughs> ever we're the worst it's so bad it's, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but okay, so population three stars, or what I will be probably calling pop three stars, because that's what we usually call it. So pop three stars, um, we think can get up maybe to about 100 solar masses. That's sort of our upper limit on that. Um, and so one possibility is that population, a population three star directly collapsed or collapsed to a black hole. Um, and this is what, you know, Serafina studies massive black holes and how they die. And so she is the expert on core collapse. And so basically massive a pop three star. star hmm? Massive stars and how they die, not massive black holes. Yeah. I don't know yes. anything about No, you're massive, it. yeah, massive, oh my God, did I, oh my God. Mass, you, you, you are an expert on how massive stars die and they become these, what we call stellar mass black holes. Just stellar mass black hole is, uh, you know, 30 times the mass of the sun, maybe 50 times the, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 math, math, math. <laughs> yes. So, hey, Sven, can we not do that? Um, but so we say that the maximum mass of a black hole that we could really get 
from a population three star is about a hundred solar masses, maybe. We had a really big one that have collapsed really efficiently. And so it's possible that they accreted or accreted means grew. That means the black hole swallowed matter. Um, and so there's a possibility that we had a population three star collapsed into a black hole and that grew really fast and it accreted really fast. It, it, it swallowed a bunch of matter really fast. And that could possibly give us supermassive black holes sometimes. It's Wait. also possible. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I, like this is just totally brand new information to me. So <laughs> if, okay, supermassive black hole, like the way I understand the, the, the title, which, or the name, which has probably nothing to do with the reality of it. If there is a hole, that means that there is a, a place for things to go into. There is a hole. So when you say things like it ate matter, are we talking like phagocytosis? Like it absorbed something to, go, to get bigger? I have no idea like, what that word means, Imogen. <laughs> I'm sorry. So true what that means. Okay, so phagocytosis is when like um uh so like uh, uh not unicellular, like simple celled organisms like living snot balls eat their um food by basically coming up to it and they just slowly like melt around like this isn't a mouthpiece, they just literally like absorb it into their bodies and then it's just a little bit bigger piece of jello. Biologists so honestly know that that's not close. the real way, but that's a metaphor that I use for it. So in the case of a supermassive black hole, is it like eating sure, matter actually, to get bigger? But like, where does it yeah. go? Where is the hole? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't think I have a good time, but I'm feeling really attacked. Um, I'm sorry. So, okay, this is where it starts getting hard to visualize, but I'm going to give you the way I visualize it. And Great, okay. We'll so the way I think about it is if you have a trampoline and you put something that's really, really heavy and has a really small radius, you get this okay. like super steep like dip in your trampoline. Okay. So we feel good about that. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, is that the trampoline surface is effectively 2D, two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we can visualize it is because it's pushing into three dimensions. Okay. And we are animals that live in three spatial dimensions. And so our brains evolved to process three spatial dimensions. Okay. Now, this is where, this is where we reach a point where I just, the way I put it is you just got to go floppy. Like you just, it's sort of like going through rapids. You just sort of got to go, like if you fall out of your raft or whatever, if you go rigid, like you'll get hurt a lot more. You just sort of got to go like a little bit floppy and okay. just sort of like let the water take you where it's going to take you. Um, so now just pretend like we just added another dimension to your trampoline and to also the space around the trampoline. How do you, how do you think about dimensions? Like, how do you, what does that mean? I don't. Okay. <laughs> no, um, yeah. sorry, that, was, that was meant to be funny. Um, <laughs> that's a really great question. Uh, I'm a really visual person. And yeah. so what I, I think kinda, a lot of astronomers are visual. People. I think, yeah, I think it makes it, I think it's hard, to, it's not impossible to do astronomy if you're not visual, but it makes it a lot easier to do astronomy if yeah. you are. Right. So, and I also, like my training is in also mathematics, just like pure mathematics. And so we have to deal with N dimensional, which is arbitrary dimensions. It has to be generalizable to any number of dimensions, uh, which that's a real, that's a real um, mind fuck. Let me tell you, mm -hmm, hi, hi, mm -hmm. I know it's abuse that there's a bag of treats that you can see and yet not eat all of them. <laughs> what happens if you punch through the trampoline in this visual? Uh, well, that's sort of the black hole. Okay. See, yeah. Okay. There that's we a, go. That's a, that's a little bit like the black hole. The thing is you can't get out of the black hole. Um, you can't. The hole is like, it's like if you have, right, I think a mass of stars is like massive bowling balls on the trampoline. Mm -hmm. But it, black hole is like, if you just, it's, it's narrow. Well, I actually don't know what the radius is, but it just bends the trampoline so, so far that it gets to one point at the bottom. Yep. That's exactly it. Wow. That's exactly it. But the thing is, is that it's like, it's an, in, so the, what defines a black hole is that I'm going to start over again. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used to like talking and jargon. Um, so if you're going down, the reason why, if you're on a skateboard, for example, and you're going down a steep hill, the reason why you speed up is that you're going down the gravitational potential, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes, as we all know, like anyone who's a runner or who has ever ridden a bicycle up a hill, you know that you have to work really hard to get out of that gravitational potential to go up the hill, right? 
Mm -hmm. So a black hole is when your gravitational potential becomes infinitely steep. And it means that you can't get back out of there. You would have to be going faster than the speed of light to get out of the supermassive black hole's gravitational potential. And of course, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. That's a, that's a rule. That's, that seems to be the rule of the universe. Except um, space. Space can expand faster than the speed. Yes. OK, but that's space time. That, OK, right. matter. That's not matter. Space time right. is not. Oh, no. I feel like we probably just introduced something that's very confusing. <laughs> very cavalierly just like oh yeah but that's space time that's not matter <laughs> i'm just nodding mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, no. i'm still so stuck it's like okay it's like sisyphus in space i'm there i got that <laughs> um okay everyone space time is not matter space time is it's like a big jello it's like a, a big jello that grow it's a growing jello yeah yeah, it's a, it, yeah, it's a growing jello. It's a growing it's a jello. Um, the second time we've used jello as a metaphor, it does work. It, it's really good. Like, and everyone's kind of like shaking some jello in their life, probably. That's true. So, Except for jello shots are disgusting. And I've hated uh, them since I was they a freshman are, not, in college. Don't try them, kids. They're not fun. Wait, am I the only no. one who likes them? I, I, I just find them like frustrating i'm just sort of like sitting there just like oh this doesn't taste as good as i want it to and, and now sticking. my hands are sticky like i'm i'm yeah. i'm not four <laughs> you can't put it in your hand you gotta have a little plastic cup and you just pop that yeah but i'm messy i'm messy seraphina like i'm a i'm a disaster i eat like a toddler someone says just... gourmet jello shots are a delight i don't know what that means what? those two words yeah, cannot I'm exist a i'm a grad student i'm Poor. I don't, I don't know this gourmet. I don't know what this gourmet situation is. Like, I'm thrilled with myself when I put bok choy in my freaking dry ramen. Like, yep. I'm like, <laughs> wow, we're like the same person. <laughs> I have a couple of questions for you, Hanalar. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. I don't know. I'm an astronomer and I don't know how hard these questions are. So I, we'll see. I'm totally comfortable saying, I don't know. Okay. I, right. But I'll make a weird face. I think we can tell at this point that I make weird faces when I don't know, which is awesome at conferences when I'm giving a talk during the Q&A and someone's like, here's a question. And I'm just, or when someone's like, this is more of a comment than a question. And just immediately my chin recedes. I'm just like, I, I, I was like, right now that's recorded. How many chins can I get here on screen? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, now it's sorry, recorded. Sorry. It's already been done. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So a couple of, well, actually first question this highly curved space time, so space time around a really massive object, contain energy? Does space time contain energy? Uh, I would say yes, insofar as mass and energy are the same thing. So this is part of how I. Hello, Sven. Sven has actually, actually, Sven knows the answer to this, and he's just so frustrated he can't speak. <laughs> I'm a scientist. I know the answer. I know the truth. I can unite just general listen. relativity and quantum mechanics. I just don't have a larynx. I can't speak. Poor guy. Oh, the struggle of Sven. No um, larynx, no thumbs. Mm. <laughs> horrible. Um, no, so I think of matter as being basically pinches in space time. So space time is this jello and matter is just different pinches of it. And okay. like the and you you know, like we're all just pinches of space time, right? And like we only ever see anything because of just light hits us and bounces off. And then our eyeballs take in that information and our brain creates a picture out of it. Like, but all that we are is just something that just I mean, that's all that we are is pinches in space time. We're just really complicated pinches in space time. Um, so highly curved space time does contain a lot of energy in that it contains a lot of mass. And in particular, when you get into relativistic regimes, mass and energy are one and the same, essentially. But Which is what that whole time itself that has that energy. It's right, the... right, right. Right, but it's been, it's sort of like, it's deforming, it's again, going back to the trampoline, you put energy into that trampoline, deforming it, sort of like pressing on a spring, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same deal, um, where it's, yeah, you're completely correct. The space time itself doesn't have the energy. Energy has been put in to deforming the space time. Completely okay. correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, okay, that's really cool. 
So, I think it's groovy. <laughs> what, uh, I'm going to take a step back. What are your, what's your favorite thing about black holes? Like what is the most, what is one of your favorite things? And also what is something that you're most curious about with black holes? So if we were to go into like, what is Hanalu's favorite thing about black holes? We would be here for like six hours as I like <laughs> rambled through a bunch of stuff. But the I will problem say- problem with this, with this stream is that we go for like three hours and I'm like, I'm so sorry, everyone. I forgot that there are people watching this and people don't want to sit for three hours. So I'll go with the first thing that like completely but hits please, me with awe. Me. Yeah. Like the first thing that hits me with awe, because like there's so many incredible things about black holes. Again, like I could honestly, if we had like a 12 hour stream of me just monologuing about black holes, I could do that. But um, <laughs> I love, I love them. I think they're incredible. And also I TA a course about black holes. And so I, I've got a lot of black hole facts just, but my, I think the first thing that really, uh, one of the reasons why they wowed me enough that I wanted to dedicate myself to studying them is they are the furthest things that we can see in the universe besides the cosmic back uh, blah, blah, cosmic microwave background, which is background radiation from essentially the expansion after the Big Bang. Um, we can see these really what we call quasars, and I'll explain what a quasar is besides in a second here, but we can see quasars from 12 billion light years away. It took 12 billion years for the light from these things to get to us, um, which means that we are seeing them as they were essentially a billion years after the Big Bang. And that is just the fact that they can power that, the fact that they have that much power, that much energy is just, it. it so I love horror. Horror is my favorite genre. I love horror movies. I love horror podcasts. I love horror stories. I love all that. And I love Eldritch horror. And I want to be clear, I do not love H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. He is a horrible, horrible human, massively racist, disgusting person. But I love Eldritch horror, this idea of something that you gaze upon and it, you can't understand it. It's mad. It, it, it drives you to insanity just to consider it. And to me, black holes are the closest thing we get to Eldritch abominations in the universe is that it, I, I think about them and the pit of my stomach drops. And I love that. That is such an amazing, awe-inspiring thing. So there's some fascination with this really terrifying, yeah. incredible thing out in the Yeah, it's, it, like it is truly awesome in the biblical sense of what these are able to do. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, it's like a laser pointer that is able to shine from 12 billion light years away and it still gets here. Yeah. Like that is just, and through all of the dust, all of the galaxies, all of the everything in the universe, it is so powerful that still gets shot to us. And so I think that's what, hi, 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 that's a lot, that's a lot of noise. That's a lot of noise. Are those, are those 12 billion, uh, light years away black holes are those the primordial black holes no so primordial black holes are actually quite small and the idea is that they should what we call evaporate I didn't say, sorry uh, <laughs> this is why i have a bag of treats is to is to quell um hi spen that's enough uh so primordial black holes are expected to actually be quite small and to evaporate which is this process of Oh goodness. Um, so Hawking radiation is this thing where, oh no. Okay, so I'm gonna give everyone some existential dread real quick. I hope that's okay. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is the problem with black holes is that like there's very little that you can just say on its own. There's a lot of you have to build up to. It. But okay. we can do this pretty quick. So there's something called the, the vacuum energy, the quantum vacuum energy. And it's just sort of the property of our universe and other universes could potentially have different vacuum energies that would fundamentally shape how their universe is structured. Um, and there's actually no reason why our vacuum energy should stay the same and it could potentially change. And if it were to fluctuate, then everything would disappear out of existence suddenly. Isn't that fun? Love it. Um, and so out of the vacuum energy, you can actually have um, these what's called virtual particle pairs be created because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that 
if these things exist for less than a certain amount of time, who gives a shit? You know, nature doesn't notice, so to speak. What is what is a virtual particle? Like it exists, but it doesn't exist. It exists, but very, very briefly. And so the idea, like Bitcoin. The, like Bitcoin. <laughs> um, so the idea of it is a virtual part. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says we can only observe something to a certain. We can only observe its momentum and its position to a certain uh, level of precision, right? Mm -hmm. And so that gives us a time scale that something can exist on. And if it exists for less time than that, nature doesn't notice, you know? It kind of can pop in, a virtual particle is one that exists for such a short period of time that it pops into existence and then annihilates with its antiparticle fast enough that nature doesn't notice. Why are there antiparticles? Oh God, I'm not a particle physicist. Ask oh, Dylan. Sorry, I'm, Ask, I'm Dylan. <laughs> Ask Dylan. I don't know because because they exist <laughs> and everything's but upsetting. Huh? I said because they're there. Yeah. So there's. I mean, there are reasons why they're there, but I'm not a particle physicist, so I'm ill-equipped to give actually a good intuitive explanation of it. But so the level that I'm willing to say is there are particles and there are antiparticles and when they collide, they annihilate and it releases energy. And so this ha can happen all the time and it doesn't generally matter. But if it happens at the edge of a black hole, what can happen is that one of those virtual particles gets um, kicked out and the other gets sucked into the black hole. And this is just a, a weird thing that can happen because of this virtual particle creation and it's called Hawking radiation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually fairly complicated. I mean, this is part of why we think of Hawking as one of the great geniuses, right? Is he came up with crazy shit like this. And he's like, oh, obviously. And I'm like, what were you smoking? <laughs> How did you, what? But uh, it's actually a thing that uh, the math works out. And so, but here's the thing is that the universe doesn't just let you make stuff for free. That's not something that gets to happen. And so this virtual particle, its partner gets sucked into the black hole. It gets kicked out. And as a result, we now have this new particle in the universe. And so something has to lose energy to make up for the energy that went into creating that particle. And the black hole is the thing that loses that energy. And so over a very, very long period of time, the black hole can eventually evaporate. It can lose all that energy that makes up its mass. And this should happen over many, many lifetimes of the universe. This is not something that has generally happened. But the idea is primordial black holes are low enough, have a small enough mass to be evaporated. Um, so, so you can't escape interest rates even in space. Oh, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, exactly. So is this, um, like black holes swallowing particles, leaving other particles. Is that an explanation for the reason why we actually have matter and there is this asymmetry in the universe? Is it because like, of black holes? That's a great question and I have no idea. Cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. That's cool. a great question. Um, and that is something that I am not equipped to answer. Uh, and this is something everyone watching, like, here's the thing is that science, any scientist that tells you that because they're a scientist, they know all of the science is someone you should never trust. Yeah, right. Because as a scientist, you are trained to be very, very specialized in a very specific thing. Right. And, you know, I, I would say that a scientist is generally is usually better at evaluating expert resources than a yeah, non-scientist right. Right. about science. An expert science resource, yeah. sorry, not mm -hmm. the, not in general, but like there's just things where I'm just like, you know, I, I know about that, you know, I know about the issue of why is there an asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the universe? I know that's an issue. I don't know what the answer is to that. Yeah. Um, that's a, what you are asking is a great question and I am not ashamed to say. Let's see if anybody <laughs> in the comments. Um, Okay, question for you that I, I want to keep talking about black holes, yes. but I also want to talk about flat earth and okay yes let's take a little bit of a break because i feel like we've been doing really dense stuff let's take yeah. a little bit of a break a little bit of a little bit of a sherbet in between like as a palate cleanser yeah. right right yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. okay the earth is flat convince me otherwise <laughs> <laughs> i feel like 
I feel like the flat earthers did an amazing job of convincing you that the earth is not flat in behind the curve. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but here's one, but I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not just going to be an asshole. I'm not just going to be an asshole. I will actually say, so what I'm referring to is there was a documentary that I was lucky enough to be in an amazing documentary done by um, Nick Andert and Daniel Clark. And Carolyn Clark was also super active in it. I don't know enough about how movies get made to know what their specific roles are, but those are the three that I knew. And they're amazing. And they did an incredible job. And it's in the final on scene, Netflix, and it's linked. It's on Netflix. Yes. Section thing. Hi, Sven. Um, so it's called Behind the Curve. And it's actually this incredibly empathetic look at uh, flat earthers and why they believe what they believe. And and I, I really appreciate that because I think that one thing that people make a mistake of is they just mock people and they don't try to understand why they have this framework, which is so, and that's something that I love about the documentary. And I'm honestly really honored to have been part of something, you know, I was not part of like making that, you know, that was all Nick and Daniel and Carol, like making that decision of like, hey, we're going to treat this way. So I don't want to take credit for that, but it's an honor mm -hmm. to have been part of something that took that kind of attitude. But anyway, at the very end of it, what they did is they had this high powered laser. And the idea is that um, if the laser shoots out, if the earth is flat, then if you have two boards faced a pretty far apart away from each other, I don't know, maybe like quarter mile, I, I forget what the exact distance is, it should hit at the same point on those boards. And if the earth is curved, it'll hit at a higher point on the, on the further board because the surf, the, the, um, the surface the board is standing on is falling away, right? Okay. And this would be easier if I had a whiteboard. Um, <laughs> I need to tell. I guess what I need to tell my advisor, Mitch. I need to have a whiteboard so I can explain why flat Earth isn't a thing. And they'll say, Hanaler, why are you spending your time on that? Do your research. <laughs> <laughs> Hanaler, work on your simulations. <laughs> um, but no, but it's uh, Sven. It's okay. I know it's very traumatic that there are treats that you are not eating. I'm abusing him. It's cool. Um, but <laughs> so what happened and what was shown in Behind the Curve is that, of course, the um, laser goes out and it hits way higher on the board, on the second board, on the further out board than it does on the, um, on the first board. And from that, you can actually derive approximately the, the radius of the, of the Earth. Of course, the Earth is not actually a sphere. It's a, a little bit oblate. It's a little bit, I mean, very minorly, but it's, you know. But, um, it's the most sphere. It's, like, it's a smush sphere. Yeah, it, yeah. Sorry, oblate's not a super helpful word in general. Um, you can tell that I just like went straight out of finals immediately into a submerging myself in my research <laughs> and have not emerged at all to interact with people. <laughs> um but yeah so that I mean that's which is yeah so that's how you can you can get basically the radius of the earth from that exact experiment so in this documentary did you talk to flat earthers like what I did not talk to them so um what happened is that they uh the crew came and they talked to me they talked to me about why I thought flat earthers were a thing they uh, you know, as an astrophysicist, they talk to me about, you know, the reality of things, <laughs> um, you know, and a little bit about how to possibly combat this and how can we, um, I am so sorry, everyone. My dog is just very dramatic. Like, you really just... hear it though. Like I have, I have pets, so okay. like I don't even notice it to yeah, be totally fine. honest. You're that's okay. Fine. Well, that's great. That's fantastic. I can't tell how much of it gets picked up on my microphone and how much it doesn't. Cause my microphone is through uh, my headphones, but yeah. Um, and you know, that's the, the big thing is why I think this is so, this is why I do science communication really. Like I love getting people excited about science. I care a lot about that. And I think it's important to get people excited about science and make them realize that science isn't this like obscure thing they can't understand which to some extent science has historically I mean people like Carl Sagan have done did an amazing job of making science feel accessible but you know the big my issue with shows like for example the big bang theory which it's fine if you like it like it, it's okay to like shows that I I don't but it's one of those things where my big issue with that is it makes science seem 
like this really hard to access thing, like this hard to understand thing. And, and, and science isn't, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, maybe doing novel science is hard, but doing, yeah. doing anything novel is hard in any field. I mean, so that's, that's why I do this is because having people feel empowered to understand science keeps them from being as, as, as easily seduced by these kind of conspiracy theories, which again, you know, naively, you know, you look out and you don't see the earth falling away from you because its curvature is pretty big. Right. You know, it's not like that tiny, actually, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna admit that I watched that show uh, because the worst, no, that show has the worst fans. Like, I love that show, but it has the worst, it has the worst fans. So I'm not gonna. A show that you're not saying, you're, a yeah, show the that show shall that not be I'm named. Not saying, okay, okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> Fair. But it, it, um, you know, the earth, I can understand why they look out and has explanatory power. It explains why the earth doesn't fall away from them um, when they look out. And the thing is, is that if we empower people to understand science then they're, and to employ science in their day-to-day -day lives, they're going to be willing to engage with that. And when it comes to flat earth, okay, fine. Like they believe the earth is flat, ha ha, that's sort of goofy. But we're now seeing how this is going to literally kill thousands of people because people aren't wearing masks because people aren't taking COVID-19 seriously. Because I right. mean, before that, people weren't taking vaccines seriously. And so all of a sudden measles was a thing again. What? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, it's one of these things where, okay, fine, ha ha, like flat earth, what harm does that do? Well, in and of itself that, you know, they're just wrong. But this idea of not believing science and not believing scientific expertise yeah. does actually lead to thousands and ultimately millions of deaths and that no, is horrible absolutely and i think like your point is really good so i haven't seen the documentary but i've added it to my list because it sounds cool i think it's cool that you know you say like they're talking they're framing these real people in an empathetic light and obviously <laughs> i think it's so important to be empathetic towards other people when it comes to different faiths belief systems things that you're just not knowledgeable about because obviously like you don't know something until you know something right? Exactly. But yeah. then we bring in the, the additional layer what, that you just mentioned, which is when these types of beliefs or refusing to accept an expanded worldview comes to the cost of other people's safety and their health and their lives. And just like you talking about, you know, people who are flat earthers refusing to accept science, it's the same thing as schools who refuse to, you know, teach evolution. And basically all it's doing is it's cherry picking who the experts are based on how some system fits into your worldview. And granted, we're all guilty of, you know, perceiving our world in the way that makes sense to us. But when it comes to the cost of something else, I feel like it's easy to see this domino effect that you're exactly, that you're talking about. And it's the same, whether it's, you know, it's not, it, it makes it less funny. Ha ha. When you talk about it in the context of, Oh, it's just someone who doesn't believe that the earth is round because what else exactly. do they not believe? What are they, you know, exactly. to not believe. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I mean, and here's the thing is actually, I have a super brilliant friend from Los Angeles, Lamar Glover. He's also in the documentary. And he makes this great point where all of these people that come up with these conspiracy theories that are trying to buy into them, they are, they are people that could have been scientists because they have this deep drive to understand the universe and understand how the world works. But we didn't reach out to them. We didn't make it accessible to them. And at the end of the day, that's all that's part of our job. Right. And no, like, that's really well said. like, this is part of our job. And I, I know a lot of people, I, a lot of people in my department, and I'll say, I think it is our obligation as scientists to communicate our science. And they go, I don't think so. I think our job is just to do science. I say, no, it, it, it isn't. That's such a, that's a, such an antiquated view of what we're doing. Our right. job is like, frankly, we are not doing anything that what we're doing has more to do with, well, okay. What Serafina and I do has more to do with art than that than anything that's profitable because all that we're doing is finding stuff that's beautiful to share that beauty with people. You do something that's actually directly useful. You actually do stuff that like saves animals and stuff, uh, Imogen. But <laughs> Serafina and I are studying this stuff that's just, it's beautiful. And what's the point of finding all of that beauty? You know, we can say, oh, well, looking to confirm these things, we develop a bunch of technologies that like, you know, we end up making a ton of money off of. And that's true. That's, that's not wrong, but that's not why we do it. You know, like we're doing this because it's beautiful and we want to share that beauty. And I think that it is the height of arrogance to say, I'm just going to study this beauty and I just don't feel like it's my job to share that with people. 
and maybe that's going to piss people off. It probably is. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm not afraid to do that. I think that in particular, if your science is just, I'm finding beautiful things about the universe, you need to communicate that. Yeah. That's right. something everyone has a right to. Everyone right. has a right to seeing that beauty. We're always told that, you know, science isn't complete until it's disseminated or it's distributed to the, distributed out into the world. But peer review isn't that process because of open access. It's not something that's easily digestible. I write in terminology based we on have to. Delivering, delivering the work that I do, but that's only half the equation. If, if you know, you're reading and you're like, what the hell does that mean? But I'm not instilling any kind of interest in the next generation or telling people why X, Y, and Z might be important. And so that's why science communication, you know, is unfor it's so unfortunate that science communication is a hobby and, you know, people aren't valued for it because, you know, obviously there's disproportionate labor within yeah. science communication and, and who does it, who has the privilege to be able to do it. Right. And, you know, obviously that, that affects communities in disproportionate ways. And if we're not doing that, then we're just, you know, it's that ivory you know white ivory tower bullshit is really what it boils down to yeah no it's super real and it's one of these things where i think you know, i think it's amazing to be seeing more gender minorities doing science communication because growing up i mean growing up for me because i'm i'm 28 uh everyone that i ever saw was a white man and then you know for people a little bit younger than me they did see neil degrasse tyson um which of course that's now a whole we don't need to open that can of worms though. We don't need to, we don't need to invite a screaming horde of fanboys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it's one of these things where it's amazing to see greater diversity. I think that's something that's incredible about Twitter. You know, social media has brought a lot of things that aren't amazing, such as like Nazis and also anti-vaxxers and also a lot of other stuff. But what's incredible is that it has made science communication accessible to people that historically have had or not just historically like actually now today have a ton of barriers yeah and you can just go directly to your audience now and that's incredible and that's beautiful and I think that's an incredible thing about you know Twitter in particular I think Twitter is in particular a really great place for that Imogene um, I have a question for you Hanalar yeah. said like you know part of our job is almost like art because we are looking at these really beautiful things and trying to understand them do you find that to be also true in what you do is your eye kind of catches something where you're just like this is you know beautiful and beautiful can mean different things but is that true for what you do as well yeah i think that they're kind of, i think about that in two different ways so like you know for me as a wildlife biologist i study um you know animals in their natural habitats because i'm really fast like you know seeing an individual animal in a landscape is is you know, beautiful in a multifaceted way. One, there's the wild animal doing whatever it is and it's given ecosystem and that's, you know, like a pretty picturesque, you know, obviously you think animal planet or discovery, but then there's the understanding that an animal plays a specific role in a system. So it's literally the spider web of life. And so yeah. thinking about it in terms of big picture is something that really motivates me. Um, but then to take it like another nitty gritty level, you know, like I work in a field, so that's like the field side of what I do, but then in the lab, like I got my start doing like, you know, manual uh, salting out methods to extract DNA from tissue. And if you like, for, for those of you that are watching, if you're on TikTok, there's like a couple viral videos that I guess have gone around since quarantine. And it's basically like people using like dish soap and salt to, um, to isolate DNA from like bananas or strawberries. And, you know, Wait, you use, what? yeah, so it's, it's yeah, basically, what? It's okay. So like, first of all, I don't have a, so I don't have a TikTok, but I have seen these videos. Basically people are taking like, um, like a little Ziploc bag, you put in a banana, you add some dish soap to it, you macerate it, you add salt to it, uh, you macerate it again, and then you add like, al like rubbing alcohol to it, and then you strain it off. And what you're left with is this um, snotty looking viscous solution in your ethanol, and that's actually DNA. And so the way that it works is it's similar to the type of work that I got started in using bobcat tissue. And it's literally using like a, um, an adjutant to lice open your cells to release your nuclear DNA, cleaning it up with a salt and then precipitating it, in, precipitating it out into a new medium using your, your, your isopropyl alcohol. And so like for me, like when I first got started, you know, I'm sitting in a lab doing this all by hand in these little test tubes. And, you know, DNA is really fragile and you have to, you know, if you're going to manipulate it or spin it or vortex it, you can't 
you can't just like shake it up like a cocktail shaker, right? Because you'll basically fragment the strands of DNA, which will make it more difficult to piece together in later in downstream reactions. And so like when I'm trying to precipitate or clean this DNA, I'm literally holding a test tube and I'm just inverting it back and forth really delicately. And so for me, just like sitting in, in the lab for like hours and hours, I have like this clear liquid in a clear test tube. And as I might like moving it back and forth, like this whole snot, like jelly type complex starts to develop to, to piece together because all the DNA is aggregating or it's like clustering together because of the the um, isopropyl alcohol. And I just think that's so fucking cool because it's literally so cool. The building hey, is life like just looks like snot, but it's so okay, but cool. Hey, I honestly though, like I am fighting the urge to go get one of my dog's bananas because I don't get to eat bananas anymore because they love bananas so much. Um, <laughs> I know. And I just wanted to go and try this with the banana. Hi, Sven, I know, it's, it's horrible. Your life can is very you, hard. Can you analyze that DNA to like learn about the structure? Like what did, I don't know, learn DNA things? I don't know. Say that again. Can you, can you like study that DNA to learn about um, like the original structures? Like, let's say you do this with both bananas and strawberries. Can you then isolate the DNA and I, and like analyze it to figure out what is the DNA of bananas and what's the DNA of strawberries? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You, I mean, like that's, so that's not a system that I work in, but basically you could absolutely sequence that DNA and look at individual base pair variation and then I guess like you, if you're really looking at like how, like where did they differ on like the evolutionary tree that is fruit? Like where are the genetic strength changes that result in the evolutionary trajectory that split them? You could certainly do that. That's so cool. And, that's, and I, that's, cool. that's not the work that I do. I don't work with multiple species phylogeny. So like, I understand, you know, I, I understand the idea of it, but that's not something that I'm currently doing. Like I'm working at, um, I work at like the species level. So looking at within species diversity um, to look like evolutionary lineages or contemporary population structure. Um, but there is a whole branch. So it's an evolutionary biology where people are basically partitioning it out. Like when did strawberries split off from bananas and what exactly is the base pair change? Is it a mutation? Is it a deletion? Is it an insertion or, you know, I'm, ta I'm painting broad strokes here, but realistically, yes, that's the that's kind so of- cool. That is so cool. That is like, so, that is so freaking cool. That is amazing to me. I like, do like is, DNA. <laughs> so everyone who's watching, like keep in mind, like scientists that are talking to scientists who aren't in their field of expertise have the same amount of wonder that you do. Like we are not like these people that are like, oh, I know these things. <laughs> yeah. Like no. we are not dating. We're like, we're like kids in a candy shop. And they're like, what? That's not true. Me more. You can see my face get closer to the camera when I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, tell me more. I know the whole time no. you're talking, Hanlor, I'm just like, close your mouth, close your mouth. Like, not you, me. I like imaging, close your mouth, keep it closed. Like, look good for the camera, but also like, close your mouth. <laughs> no, it's like, it, but that's, I guess it's, I think it's helpful for people that aren't scientists to know that like scientists are feeling the same thing whenever they hear about something that is not their expertise as everyone else. Like we are, we are literally, we're just like, but literally we're just like you. We're just, yeah. you know, like if you, I, there's a lot of stuff about any random person's job that I probably don't know about. And you would have to explain in detail to me. It's yeah. just, we just use a jargon that is sort of hard to parse. Yeah. Um, which is like, part of- Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's just, it's part of science communication to bridge mm -hmm. that gap of like, okay, here's all of this jargon. Here's all of these layers. Let's peel that back and like, you know, mm -hmm. It's just, it's just less commonly used language. That's what it basically comes down right. to. Yeah. That's true. And so it is our language, sorry, this is a pedantic point, <laughs> but it is language that relies on other parts of language in order to build a picture. Sure, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's just, we don't use that way of framing things. You know, like I'm not like walking around, like talking about the energy levels of my, freaking kiwis that I'm buying at Trader Joe's you know what I mean like you know I'm not I'm not doing that <laughs> what was your question oh I was gonna ask since, since you're talking about science communication people being excited I was gonna ask I guess the question for both of you um kind of like uh based on so sorry let me back up in my field like science conferences you know are awesome and fun and it's a great way to share your research it's a great way to learn about other people's research 
Um, and so like whether it's like the presentations, the posters, the plenary sessions, um, these conferences obviously are fantastic in my field. But like one thing that I really appreciate in my field is these conferences like have all these different socials. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there's something to be said about it. Like certain people, like if you don't drink alcohol, having an evening social can be kind of hard. And some organizations, you know, get around this and address this better than others. Um, you know, fortunately, some of the conferences I've been to have like have they have coffee social hours, you know, for people who don't drink alcohol or they can't for whatever reason. Um, but anyways, that aside, that like that statement aside, I was just curious are in you guys's field is our scientific conferences like the socials kind of like what we're doing right now. Is that something that regularly happens at conferences? Really? I mean, that's a, I mean, in my field, I guess in my subfield, it's a huge part, right? But like, yeah, I mean, so I went to a while ago, I went to a really pause jargon unpacking. So um, there is, okay, so you, there's only so fast you can eat food, right? Before you start puke, or, you know, before like you would get sick, right? Challenge like there's accepted. only so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm a garbage only... human. <laughs> there's only so much you can like, you know, shove into someone before they, well, the black hole's the same way. Okay, uh, okay. I mean, it's a different mechanism other than like your stomach being like, no, but, right. <laughs> but it, it, you can intuit it the same way. Um, and that limit is called the Eddington limit. And it's a relation between um, how fast the bot, the how fast the compact object, in my case, the black hole is growing and how bright it is, how, how much energy you see coming out from this radiation that we talked about. Um, I was at a conference about soup, what we call super Eddington astrophysics, which is cases where the luminosity exceeds that relationship. Uh, it basically, this, these things are growing faster. They're either growing faster than their luminosity would indicate, or the luminosity is greater than what their mass growth, mass growth would indicate. Um, and there, that honestly was like a huge central part of that conference was like just hanging out and chatting. Um, you know, part of this is it was a very Europe, like a European uh, heavy conference. So I think that's part of that is, is a different culture as in the US. It's treated a lot more like industry of like, oh yes, like, oh, we gotta be boop, 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 boop. Like very, very, whereas yeah. like in Europe, the academic culture is a lot more like, let's hang out, let's have like, let's have a lunch beer and let's chat about, you know, our science. And then like at dinner, like, oh, let's just hang out and have a nice long lengthy dinner and chat about science. So at least for a lot of what I've done, yes, that's a huge part of it is like right. hanging out and chatting and like, so I think that's that a huge thing. I have had a similar experience in that there are sort of lunches and dinners and happy hours that exist to theoretically talk about science with other people in the field, but I don't know if this is just my, like the way I approach those events, but to me, it's always seemed more like a networking thing than ever actually getting into a meaningful discussion about science. Sure, there's like the occasional one-offs, but I haven't really had that experience where, you know, I, I learned something deep and profound in those, in those uh, happy hours or whatever. Right. Um, and I think I've also had this, like, you know, it is all very high level where you're talking, in my case, to a bunch of other supernova people. So, you know, we're talking about the latest advances and, you know, X survey, and we're not actually thinking about how do we talk about this to other people? Because we are surrounded by people who are, who do the same things that we do. That's real. That's yeah. really real. There's a very, there's very much so a disconnect of like not talking about how to talk about this with other people. That I do not see. Yeah. And I also do see, how do you break into that? Like if you're a shy that, person or a new right. person, how do I walk up and, and feel comfortable? Yeah. And so there's this idea of like a lack of access, certainly. Yeah. That's super real. And it's real. Like I'm a big part of why I'm able to network the way I, I do. Like I have ADHD. I am neurodivergent. Um, a big part of why I am comfortable networking as much as I am is because I homeschooled. And so I didn't have a bunch of peers like being like, why the fuck are you so weird? Like, I just sort of was like, Meh. I just hang out on my computer and look up stuff on the internet all day. Cause I'm a big yeah. nerd, yeah. you know? Like, And then, so I recognize that there's a lot of 
I, I have a lot of privilege in that is that I, you know, I wasn't bullied for my neurodivergence, but I know that is a big barrier for a lot of neurodivergent people, a lot of URMs, a lot of gender minorities feeling comfortable breaking this. And that's something that I think that we as broadly a field, you know, science, but like seriously, science academia needs to figure out how we can make these sort of networking events and these sort of connecting, chatting about our science how we can make that something that's more accessible for people that do not feel as comfortable. I'm just like, I, I'm just an asshole. Like I am just like, hi, I'm here. I'm very excited. I, <laughs> I, I think Twitter meetups help. Yes. Sorry, Sarah, if any of you had a delay. Agreed. I've always thought of myself as extroverted, but I think the longer that I'm in this sort of like self-isolation um, lockdown sort of uh, experience, I've learned that I think I might actually be far more introverted than I thought. Um, and I've seen that now reflecting on my experiences at conferences where my very first like big conference, it's the American Astronomical Society. And there was, you know, people from all over the United States, you know, so many people were there, I don't know, of order a thousand or something like that, probably more. And after my first, after I presented my poster, I literally went to my hotel room and read for the next like three days. Like I would go to the mandatory things I had to go to, but I was so overwhelmed and like had no idea how to interact and introduce myself and, you know, have a sort of like without a guide, I was totally lost. And so there is, a, at least for me, I was very, very scared to be like, I don't know anything about black holes. Please tell me things you know like it's easier for me once I know someone and I I feel okay confessing confessing my ignorance but you know it's a lot harder when that sort of camaraderie does not exist mm -hmm. it's so real right no, no like it's very a, true. it's I mean and again I'm really lucky in that I just have absolutely no shame um and <laughs> But no, like my first advisor in undergrad was incredible. My first research position in undergrad was with the high energy experimental group at University of Maryland. And kind of the, the person who what was leading that. Oh, high energy means, well, it, the LHC, uh, the large, large Hydrogen Collider. It was like smashing particles together real fast. Cool. Real speedy. One of the experiments that uh, detected the Higgs boson. Hi, Sven. Wow. You're just like, yeah, yeah. And what he told me in one of my first meetings with him was never stop asking questions until you are no longer confused. He's like, and if anyone's shitty with you about it, he's like, they're bad people. And he literally said that to me. And having the chair of my department tell me, just ask questions until you're not confused anymore, like completely changed my life. But here's the thing is that not everyone has that. So I always tell that to everybody. <laughs> is just ask questions until you're not confused anymore and anyone who sucks about it is just a shitty person well okay, or maybe they're in a shitty mood if they're consistently shitty about it they're a shitty person if they were shitty about it one off it probably just means they were just in a bad mood which is fine that happens right, but right. um like that's you know i'm really lucky that i had incredible mentorship and i probably wouldn't have stayed in academia if i hadn't but is, again, part of why this is so important to have this great mentorship and also why I like adopt as many baby scientists as I can, where I'm like, any baby scientists who get into my DMs who want to be like, please help me with doing science, like I will do my best. I can't promise that like I know a ton, but I will do my yeah. best. I remember like, back, I, I had like maybe a thousand followers at this time or something and someone DM me, uh, she was a, an undergraduate physics and she was really excited but very nervous and she <laughs> asked me about how to do a physics problem and I got so excited that I literally pulled out sheets of paper I was in the car I wasn't driving I was in the car and my partner was driving and I just started doing the math for her and like was sending her screenshots and it was this very- I cool love it. Oh my God. It was, I, I, I don't do that as much anymore, but it was a really, really neat experience. Whereas you get to actually talk to people. Who, I remember being in that position where I was like, I don't know who to ask. I don't know what to do. And I have no idea how to do this. So like, you know, what am I supposed to do? And there is, I think, you know, specifically with Twitter, there is this really neat 
amazing community where that starts to be less of a barrier. And I hope, you know, the next conference I go to that I can be a little bit more like, I'm going to keep asking questions and I don't give a shit what people think. Um, but I think it is harder, you know, as a woman, as a, oh, you, for woman, sure. you know, like, uh, you know, as that thing goes, um, it just becomes absolutely to, to kind of like poke your head into spaces where maybe you don't already feel well, because yeah, because people will, you know, if a, if a white cis dude says like, oh, I don't understand it, they just go, oh, you know, if they're shitty people, they go, oh, it's just that dude doesn't know this thing. But if you are part of an underrepresented demographic and you say that, a lot of people will say, oh, see, this is why such and such group doesn't do this is right. because, and, you know, again, I'm really lucky. Like I recognize I had incredible mentorship. So while I did end up having some really negative experiences with like, you know, in academia, I had years of having all the support that just made me be like, no, fuck you. Like, yeah. you're the problem, not me. I'm fine. You suck. Goodbye. You know? Like, yeah. And that's something that honestly is one of the biggest things that when you're an undergrad, the biggest thing is you need people in your life that are nurturing you to build up that confidence to have that because later on in your career, someone will try to break you down. Yeah. And the difference between people who, you know, well, not the only difference, but something that can help people is having had that support that made them feel better. Um, and you might not yeah. ever, and you realistically might not ever have a career if you don't have that professor in the wildlife department who is Latina, you don't have a gay professor, you don't even have a female, a woman in your department. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's- I mean, this is why it's so important that we need to start actually taking that into account is, you know, people say, oh, why don't we have a greater diversity of graduate students in our department? And it's like, well, cause all your, all your fucking professors are white. <laughs> that's probably got, that's probably got at least some part. Yep. <laughs> that's probably not trivial. Yeah. Why aren't we getting more women? Well, because all your professors are men. Yeah. That's a good right. And I think the thing that's like, and I'll, okay, so obviously as a white woman, there's a lot that I don't know. And you know, I can't speak to so many things. Like my job is to listen and pass a microphone, but realistically, yeah you know, when we get like people applying to like grad positions or like a professorship position, we are assuming like, we're basically comparing their resumes like it's apples and apples, right? But, but obviously not. that's not the fucking case because we're talking about like gender bias. We're talking about like housing discrimination. We're talking about like the pay gap, you know, in their communities yeah. at home. We're talking about name discrimination and we're talking you about know, like, having the difference to... between getting grants. Like it's yeah. never apples and apples. Whatever gets to your front desk someone had to work a lot fucking harder to get That's to that real. desk. That's one thing I'm actually really proud about with CU Boulder, uh, gonna plug my department a little bit, but we actually have graduate students um, having a very major role in both graduate student um, application review and faculty, re like faculty application review. And there are a lot of really young, really progressive professors at CU uh, but especially the grad students are there being like, hey, why is why is this overwhelmingly looking like how academia has always looked? Right. Why? And I think that's something that's really special about this department. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like this is like a perfect department. And like, you know, right. when we get to the labor part, because I think we are going to talk a little bit about my, yeah. a little tiny bit of labor stuff later. But, you know, it's not a perfect university, but no university is. But I think that's something that's really great is that we have this specific mechanism built into our department to be like, hey, uh, we need to review these things and we need to take these things into account. And again, graduate students, you know, who were very recently in this position of applying to grad school, being able to be like, hey, no, you guys are not being fair. Like, think about how hard this actually would have been to be applying to grad school, to be doing undergrad with these, you know, conditions in your life. So you know, it's something that I think, that's something that I think a lot of departments should take on is right. having grad students be a lot more involved um, in those sorts of roles. Yeah. So do you, do you take a big part, I'll, I'll sort of transition to academic labor organizing, but mm -hmm. also just, you know, your experience as a grad student, have you found it to be easy to kind of 
organize and, and, and to what motivated you to start being interested in that? And can you talk a little bit about what that means to people who maybe aren't familiar with yeah, it? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I was raised by, my mother was involved in a lot of the reproductive autonomy protests in the 70s. She was part of the initial wave of Take Back the Night. My mother's always been someone who's been really involved in that kind of activist stuff. And I was raised with that. Um, so I was like, I was completely inseparable as a child, just like, <laughs> can I talk to you about reproductive autonomy? And it's like, you're eight uh, years old, stop. Like you are eight years old. This is weird and creepy and frankly unsettling. <laughs> vagina is a, is a term y'all use it. Vagina, Look is, it a, up. Vag yeah. vagina <laughs> and vulva is like super duper a term, but are two distinct terms. They're not really like, they're not the same thing at all. Um, no, right. but but it was, you know, I was lucky. I was raised, you know, I knew a lot of gay people. I knew a lot of bisexual people. Um, my mother explained like what being trans was to me super, super young. Like, you know, so for me, this has always been part of my life is like standing up for people that were marginalized. And in undergrad, I was able to do that pretty well because my department itself was really progressive. It's just that like a lot of the undergrads kind of sucked. And so it sort of just took like standing up and being like, I think you're an asshole. And they're like, oh, no one's ever said something mean to me before. My mommy always told me I was smart. You know, it was like kind of that situation. Right. But, um, you know, honestly, at my last program, there was a professor who was a really terrible person. Um, and that ended up getting a ton of coverage. And we don't really need to, we don't even need to give him the honor of naming, naming him in this. But one thing that I realized uh, through my time there is that as individuals being like, hey, this sucks and it's hurting people, it doesn't, it's really easy to ignore. And it, it, in my time there, I realized what you need is collective action. What you need is solidarity. What you need is a massive grad student saying, fuck you, we will not be doing research so long as you allow abusive PIs to be there. Like we will shut down this machine until you get rid of these abusers. Right. And it took collective action to get rid of that horrible, horrible man. Yeah. Um, and it's one of these things we're moving on. I was like, you know, I care so much about equity and access to academia. I care so much about URMs, not just being, not just being recruited to academia, but actually being retained, having their needs met. I care so much about gender minorities, having their needs met, being supported. I care so much about disabled, you know, scientists having their needs met. All of that. And it's like, it's really, as an individual, it's so easy to be ignored. And then I realize if you actually, you know, and this is not my own realization, it's something that comes from studying how did any gains ever get made? It's by banding together and saying, no, fuck you. Like we will stand with these people who are being harmed and we will say, we aren't going to do this work until you start, stop hurting them. Yeah. And so you start treating them like people. And I realized that that's the only way we're ever going to have equity in STEM is to have a coherent labor movement, to have this labor movement saying, fuck you, no, people yeah. are going to get paid a living wage. <clears throat> people are going to have, you know, people say, oh, why, you know, why is there such a bad mental health problem in academia? Well, because you provide shit mental health care. Right. You know how we get better mental health care? We say science doesn't happen. And so until you improve our insurance, right? you know, it's, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's not just people, I think a lot of times think of union stuff as being, oh, we just want to be paid more, which first of all, that's an accessibility issue. That is and an accessibility perfectly, issue. There's nothing wrong with saying, yeah. yes, fuck you, pay me. Yeah, no, there's not. And I think that's an important thing. But on top of it, it's, it's also a solid, this is to me, clearly how we get equity, like equitable, uh, you know, an equitable academia is that those of us who have more privilege, which I have a decent amount of privilege, right. you know, I'm white. Um, I have, you know, I, I, I'm neurodivergent, but like my, you know, I, I have full mobility, you know, I can pass as abled, you know, all of that, you know, having someone that has a fair amount of privilege saying, no, I'm going to, I'm going to walk off. I'm not going to do this uh -huh. until you actually give these people what they need to be able to do science. That is how we get these changes to happen. Because one person asking is really easy to ignore, you know? Right. Right. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about what's going on with Santa Cruz? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what happened in Santa Cruz, this is a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a complicated situation. So there's something called national unions. And my union actually just affiliated with Communication Workers of America, CWA. We're now CWA local 7799. So proud. Um, but so Santa Cruz, that union is affiliated with United Auto Workers, uh, which happens to have a lot of the graduate student unions on the coast. Um, and what happened is that the local, the, the leadership of that particular local voted, you know, decided to lead and the, and the rank and file voted for this to have a strike that the national didn't approve. And so the national did not um, give them the same support they would do if it was a sanctioned um, strike. And so that's what's called a wildcat strike. And so they had, they didn't have as many resources as they have available. And so what happened is these super brave student workers walked off the job and said, until you pay us enough that we can actually live in the city we have to live to do our job, you're not getting grades. Um, because it was a huge issue is that people, a lot of these you know, graduate workers at Santa Cruz couldn't afford to live in Santa Cruz right. because of how expensive it was and the fact that there wasn't a cost of living adjustment, a COLA, that's what a COLA is, is a cost of living adjustment. Yep. And so they understandably walked off the job. And so what Santa Cruz did instead of saying, oh shit, like these people can't live, um, they spent $300,000 a day for a while hiring a, a, a police force to go and pepper spray these peaceful protesters being like, hey, we're just trying to live. And so don't tell me that it's not about the money, it's about setting a precedent of the graduate workers not being able to demand what they need. Um, and they actually ended up firing a bunch of these graduate students saying, you're not allowed to do the only thing that funds your, funds your, you know, being a grad student. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so they fired a bunch of people and a bunch of them, because they no longer had income, lost their visas. And as a result, have been deported. Um, it, it, it's absolutely disgusting. And it's one of these things where these people are not asking, like they're not asking to be able to buy a Lamborghini every year. Right. They're asking to be able to pay, and they're not even asking to be able to live in a single apartment. Right. They're asking to not be, they're asking to be able to afford to live with just two or three roommates. Like that's all that they're asking. They're asking for literally the bare minimum. And- I don't know anyone in the Bay Area. I'm trying to think to make sure I'm not lying. I know, I know two people who live in, in very, very small studios, but other than that, everyone I know in the Bay Area, everyone. It is impossible to live, at least in this area of California, and I think most of California without roommates. It's so real. I mean, so I'm really lucky. My department, I, like pay, our, the Astro Department at CU really values its grad students and actually compensates us the, the most fairly of any department. But there are people at CU Boulder where they would qual they should qualify for food assistance. But the issue is, is that you get paid a certain amount, but then you have to pay over a thousand dollars a semester uh, to be able to do your job in student fees. What? Um, That's a yep. lot. And so, yep, it's and so as a result, there's a lot of people that are paid just enough that they don't qualify for SNAP. But then because they have to pay it back, if their actual salaries reckon, like reflected what they actually take home, they would qualify for SNAP. But it prevents having this record of our grad students are on SNAP. Like, I mean, not in Astro, but in other departments. Yeah. And I just like, learned a couple weeks ago that I, I qualified for food assistance through Berkeley, like through UC. Yeah. I just learned that. Yeah, no, and it's one of these things where it is wild. Like, for example, the president of CU was getting a $200,000 bonus through this COVID shit. Well, workers are getting furloughed. Well, they are, you know, well, people are losing their paychecks. And what I will say, one thing that's really cool about what CU is doing, part of our association is that we're going what's called wall to wall, which means besides a very, very small number of workers who actually are, fall under a different union, Pretty much every worker at CU in the CU system in the Colorado University system uh, can be part of our union, and we can fight for them. And it actually stands to be the Colorado 
university system is the largest employer in all of C uh, Colorado. And it's like 40,000 people, I think. And we're looking, and, and that includes the workers at um, like Denver, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on the name, but like hospitals in Denver that are treating COVID patients, we are now representing um, wow. to protect them. Yeah, and it's one of these things where it's like, why, you know, it shouldn't be necessary. It shouldn't be necessary to have to do this, but you know what, it is. It's necessary that we have to band together and say, no, like we deserve, we deserve to live. You shouldn't be getting $200,000 bonuses when there are people on food assistance. That's right. just not a problem. And so someone I, in the comments made a great point. They said that, you know, the, the sad part about all this is that say you lose your grad position or you have to, you know, whatever happens, you're not eligible for COBRA because you were never an employee. So you don't get full benefits. Right. And, you know, the idea Correct. that grads since only work 20 hours a week is, is, is not true. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Oh my God, right. I wish. Exactly. It's just not... <laughs> No, I mean, this is something that's happening actually at my old program is that they have a huge depression issue. Um, actually studies show that 80% of the graduate students at that program have are, are diagnosable for clinical depression during their PhDs. And they are trying to cut the mental health coverage right now. Yeah. And it's, it's really, really horrifying. And this is why I believe so strongly in this is that you know, if we let this continue, it's only going to be rich people with a very specific background that are going to be able to pursue academia. And quite frankly, I mean, we already did that. We did that for millennia and science didn't advance very fast. It was only once we opened science up that science advanced. Again, like looping back to what, I, I don't remember if we were streaming when I actually said this, <laughs> but like, science as a profession, science as this like actual job has only existed during the 20th century, really. Um, everyone else, it was just like rich people that just were living off of their fortunes and occasionally their apprentices or assistants like Michael Faraday, um, who was a very rare case. But in general, it's just really rich people. And uh, as we saw, science didn't advance super fast and it's advanced crazy fast since we've had it be, you don't have to have this like fortune that you live off of in order to do science. I think amazingly, I, once you compensate and support your workers, then you get reasonable results. It is is mm -hmm. almost a one to one, and amazing. You no, know, it's so real, and it's not want to do that. <laughs> it's really really frustrating. But this is you know, oh my goodness, what a beautiful kitty. This is Styx. He's an asshole. Styx is but the beautiful, best. but a beautiful one. He is. But no, he it's is. like. Spam our it's, section just with pictures of our pets. But it's like it's something that's so. And I mean, also like not to get. I mean, it's already been political, but I mean a little bit more political is that there's been you know tech companies where the workers have said, "Fuck you, we're not going to provide this equipment to ICE. We're not going to provide this software to ICE because what well, we we don't agree with what's happening." And I think that that's something that's really important is that as we move into this really technocratic society having stem workers be able to say no we don't agree with what's being done with our labor is important and it's powerful and it's what keeps us from turning into the fucking minority report you know like this is something that i think is it's not it's not just because i want better mental health care which i would oh god i would love that better mental health care <laughs> but um it's also about i think it makes the world a better place so that's why that's the thing that i do yeah um, sorry, I'm just, I, I just wrote a comment. I think it's important to kind of say verbally, it's historically, it's not that science wasn't real or that it wasn't a profession that people got excited about. It's that it wasn't equitable or compensated. Yeah. As a right. job. Exactly, exactly. No, that's exactly what it is, is that science was done by a very specific, or at least the, sorry, the science that was performed in the West and therefore has been documented, it hasn't been destroyed in colonial imperial conquest, um, has largely been done by rich people. Right. Um, the comments are saying that like Galileo, for example, was not some rich, rich 19th century person. So we can find examples in which that yeah. is overwhelmingly, yeah. you know, white men, but then also white women 
have been, you know, realistically who the doors have been open for in science. And so exactly. that creates exactly. the problem that we are talking about. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's sort of like suffrage where, yeah, you know what, white women got, you know, white men had the right to vote for a while and then white women, but then it did, you know, indigenous women didn't get the right to vote for what until the, I, I don't even fucking remember. It was late. It was like the fucking seventies or something. Like it was absolutely bonkers how late it was. Like, this is one of these things where we can't, erase all of these modes of intersectionality. And this is part of why we need to have this solidarity is because right. my lived experience and you know, Imogen's lived experience and Serafina's lived experience is going to be different from other people's. And they aren't necessarily going to understand ours and we aren't necessarily going to understand theirs. And so we have to stand together. Yeah, and right. so that's the power of collective action. Because yeah, power right. in a union. Yeah. And I think, I, anybody who, I think anybody who wants to say that that type of Anyone who wants to say institutional racism does exist, doesn't exist, or people who want to say, oh, like, you know, sure, racism exists, but we're not talking about racism. You know, everyone is created equal, and there are these problems. Like, why do we need unions? Like, if people are mad about something, they can just stand up and say something. But that's an incomplete way to look at it, because, like, yeah. what you're saying, Heiler, is that, like, you know, just look at the current situation here in the United States. Like, imagine being a person of color in America and storming your state capitol with, with all gun, your guns right? and it being fine. Yeah. Whereas yeah, what I we're mean, seeing in the it's... news is white people doing that. And it's just like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, one arrest was made. Yeah, no, I mean, it's one of these things where you can't ignore the fact that these things are enforced in racist ways. And I know that a lot of why I got away with being as much of a cheeky shit as I did. I mean, cheeky shit is like making a flip point. But the reason why I got away with being as insistent and demanding as I was, was because I'm white. Like yeah, at the end of the day, right, like right. that's like a super real thing. And right. I acknowledge, like I can both acknowledge the oppressions that I've faced in my field and also the privileges that I get, that I that I have not earned, that I have just bequeathed to me. And it's- Both can be true. Exactly. And that's something that I think that people need to be better about. Like we see a lot of this of like, oh, well, I can't be racist or I can't be sexist or I can't be homophobic or I can't be transphobic or I can't be ableist because I'm this, yeah, you can, buddy. <laughs> like, buddy, you can. And again, the way to face, like the way to fight that is solidarity. And so this is, yeah. Also. Uh, okay, I want to quickly transition um, if that's okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut yeah, you off. No, no, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Um, okay, so. I really want to quickly transition to one of my favorite questions, which yes. is went back to what we talked about at the beginning of the of the show, which I don't even know if it was recorded or not, but I'm gonna go there. <laughs> uh, so my question is, what is one of the weirdest and or <laughs> most memorable memories you have doing science? Oof. I did not ask this question. Sorry. <laughs> that is a that. I know it's a whopper. Everyone can a a drink while she's thinking. <laughs> so I think one of the big ones is um, so as I was talking about a little bit before. Um, so one proposed formation mechanism for supermassive black holes is that we have these really, really big stars that collapse to a black hole and then that black hole um, accretes really rapidly and it grows really fast. And I think one of the most surprising things is I never expected that to be even slightly viable. <laughs> and I think one of the most surprising things that ever happened to me in my scientific career is I ran a simulation, ran a couple of simulations and I, you know, was just sitting there fussing around with my um, Python script. I was like, all right, let's go ahead and plot the, you know, mass versus time, whatever. And holy shit, these fuckers grew. <laughs> like, I'm literally, like, I just remember just sitting there just like, ah, ah, ah. like, you know, just sort of, honestly, it was just the most Oh my God, baby. He's like, oh, man, really I've been waiting for you. <laughs> birthday boy. Look at the birthday boy. He's like perched up on the neck pillow. 
Um, is he a little yeah. dog or a big dog? I feel like I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry. Cheers, very little. He's 20 he's, pounds. Oh, he's a little boy. He's so cute. He's a little boy. Um, but yeah, is there one of these moments of just like, oh, huh? <laughs> like it's sort of where you expect that simulation like you you run these expecting them to be like null res- you expect it to be like oh hey like that's not a thing and being like refuting that this is like a possibility and then oh my god the simulations show like it works <laughs> um, so awesome yeah I mean it was an incredible <clears throat> moment that's um, so cool it was I mean and again I'm not saying that we've like solved the supermassive black hole formation problem what I'm saying is that the specific thing we thought could be a barrier isn't a barrier. It's um, but you know, it's all a long process. It's not. It is not like it is solved because accretion is just such a multi-scale problem that. Um, what does that mean? Oh, great question. Uh, so accretion disks have really important mechanisms happening on all sorts of size scales. So some of those size scales are like literally basically like the size of the disc is like these um, these physical processes that they're, well, they're characteristic length scale, which I'm trying to figure out a better way to put it. But the, what does that mean, Hanoi? <laughs> okay, so if you were to take like, all right, you got a bucket full of ice and you drop a rock in it, there's going to be a certain most of the cracks in that ice are going to be a certain length, right? There's going to be some small ones, there's going to be some long ones, but most of them are going to be approximately, this, maybe this is me being a farm kid who had to like break a lot of ice out of water troughs. <laughs> Wait, what kind of animal? I grew up on a farm too. What kind of farm did you guys have? Uh, uh, horses, chickens, and hay. Nice. Okay. We had chickens and goats. I love goats. I love chickens. I actually had two chicken tattoos. That's amazing. Are yeah. they, are they, are you, can you share them or are you willing to share them? So that's a baby. That's a chick. Oh, I love it. And this oh, is an least. adult. This is an adult. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. No, Machine, can you, can you just summarize your experience with goats growing up? It's my favorite. Yes, please. I would love, I love goats. I want to hear about it. Um. Tell me. Seraphine always know, already knows the punchline for this. Um, I showed dairy goats for nine years. So imagine um, Westminster. The, imagine the Westminster Dog Show, but with goats. Well, was it 4-H? Did you do 4-H? I did. I had 4 I was in 4-H. Oh, I was a yeah. junior 4-H leader. I was, um, I was a state FFA officer for North Carolina. I was big into like the agriculture education, but... I have a lot of like goat t- uh, um, goat trophies at home in storage, and they're literally I like these really tall. T- they're like <laughs> it's a box of wine. This is this is the today tonight's advertisement. Tonight's episode is brought to you by yeah. the Naked Grape. Anyways, they're trophies that are like this big, um, and they have goats on them. So Imogen, why we need to talk about farm kid life sometime, like offline, maybe not right now, but we need to talk about this because. It mm-hmm. is such a mm-hmm. unique thing, mm-hmm. but okay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, going out, having to break ice out of water troughs. Like I know that, De- I know Delaware's got ice in its water troughs. I know that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I grew up in, our farm was in North Carolina. And so like, you know, we grew okay, up. Okay, North Carolina still gets some ice in their water troughs. So, like, oh, I mean, not for much. percent does. And, but like also yeah. where you can't wear, you can only wear so many layers and also be efficient at what you need to do. Yep. Mm-hmm. And if you had hay, then that means that you know what it is to have like the body hives from like carrying hay bales oh, in the summer. Oh yeah, body oh. hives. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean because you're poor, like you're sweaty, right? So your pores are open then, a little bit, and then you just get oh, hay, no. and it's everywhere, and it's just hay all over your body, and you're yep. itchy, oh, and you want God. to die. Mm-hmm. It's not just their physical <laughs> reaction of having like itchy hay on you. It's like actually getting little teeny pieces of like hay and dust. Yeah on the surface of your skin when your pores are expanded it's terrible it's not i would like to have this conversation because i need so i need an adult that i can talk to with about yeah no okay we we all right (laughs) offline we will talk about this because oh my god also my childhood like people are like why are you willing to work on the weekends it's like because my childhood was spent digging ditches (laughs) in the fucking maryland heat do you know how hot it gets in maryland in the fucking summer it's hot and it's humid and I'm just digging fucking ditches. 
just mm-hmm. and we didn't even we didn't have like an like I mean by now my parents have like this like fancy like post holer shit like on that they can put on their tractor like woo. but uh <laughs> when I was a kid it was the shit where you just like right right and you're like getting blisters all over your hands and mm-hmm. you're just you're just like I just want to be a normal kid can I read and they're like uh-huh. no we, we got like, a post hole you got a post hole we didn't get a milk machine until we were like milking 20 goats by hand. Oh and my so, God. like, it, you know, like I will literally never get carpal tunnel y'all. Like I might, not, I might not be very good in a fist fight, but like these muscles will uh-huh. never like get weak from milking goats until I just cried. And that's not no, useful it's, at all in my adult life. My God. And, horses, my so life. horses are complete fucking idiots and particular performance horses are the dumbest fucking animals on earth. I love them. I love them. Super dumb. And so all my friends, whenever they get like some sort of random cut, they're like, oh, I got a cut. And I'm like, all right, let me help. And they're like, why? Why should I? I'm like, because I fucking grew up with these performance horses that would fucking like cut themselves open and I had to tend their wounds because I was the youngest person in the family. And so that shit got shunted, off, shunted onto me. Have, like, did you, does that include like having to like lance injury boils and just boils from horses? Like I like there are videos of just watching veterinarians lance like these giant injuries on horses that are like they're boils that are like this big. And it just like, we're talking like two, three, four gallons of time and I'm out feeling out so attacked. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, Imogene, next time, next time we do drunk lines, we need one of your goat trophies. I, okay, yeah, I will like, try to find I, one. The people need to see your goat trophies. Yes, right, that's true. All right, I'll do my best. But no, I one. like literally the summer that I was 12, I spent two hours a day cold hosing hematomas on horses because ah. it was just like literally just like oh i don't love that that means like i know what a hematoma but like can you explain what a, hemat- oh, a hematoma is like a big fucking like the horse or a hematoma is what happens when you hit yourself really hard and there's a big pocket of blood and yes. uh you have to it's just like a big bruise but full of blood it's a bruise full of blood isn't it's, heart bruises it's three blood? it's three yeah but like a hematoma it's is three-dimensional three okay yeah it's like it's like bleeding into the area so, and it's just like right go ahead sorry. yeah it's just like oh hanalor is the smallest one hanalor can easily get <laughs> underneath the horses hanalor can can cold hose the hematomas and i'm there like and the horse is like, fuck you, why are you cold hosing this painful part of me? And I'm like, I need to be your own good. Oh man. Yeah. So I know he- I got a hematoma on my leg, and that's how I ended up with a blood clot two years ago. But oh, that was also so from that was a, that was from an ultimate frisbee in- injury. And it's mostly just because I'm an idiot. I kicked a frisbee, it gave me a hematoma, it completely damaged the vein. I got a blood clot, I had to have surgery. It wasn't great. <laughs> That oh my god! No one was there to hose the hematoma. <laughs> see, this is why you needed you needed to know me, and I could have been like, "I'm here, Imogene." Thank you. See, now I know. <laughs> I'm here. I'm really good at cold hosing hematomas. Oh, we're gonna make a good team. <laughs> Wait, so what was the surgery? Was it just to like pop it or like? What? No, I had to. Um, I had my uh greater saphenous vein completely ablated. So like, were they um? They act, so they, they take a, they go in through the femoral artery at the knee and they basically take a lawn, um, it's not a hot wire, but they put a catheter, they catheterize your, your uh, greater saphenous vein, I said femoral artery, I meant saphenous vein, oh. which is the vein that runs from your groin all the way to your ankle. Oh, and it supplies, it only supplies like 10% of the blood to your leg, but they basically, they yeah. use uh, microwaves, <laughs> something that I don't understand to collapse the vein. So they basically kill the vein. <laughs> It's not stripping it, so they collapse what? it, so blood can no longer flow to it, and basically, your the blood and the the veins in the rest of your leg have to um, basically Up get into, bigger yeah. to provide blood to the rest of your leg. Anything that involves the femoral makes me like actually physically ill because I am I fear the femoral artery. I fear it. Right, <clears throat> right. and you so should, like, I got I got should. mine collapsed because uh, so I had a superficial blood clot but obviously the risk of when you get a blood clot like that is getting yeah. like a dvt and so then those of like, course that's of course, of fatal. course. So like 
now I can't like I'm not wait, a, wait, like wait. that fucked up vein is not at risk for giving me a DVT we should explain what a DVT it. is we should explain oh, what a DVT is yeah a DVT is a deep vein thrombosis so you can oh. get so there's te- several different layers of veins in your body it's like you've got your giant arteries that are like really big that provide major blood flow from the heart and you've got your like smaller the femoral. veins like your femoral and then you've got small veins and you've got capillaries so like varicose veins are usually in your capillaries or like little spider veins and so those don't pose like a life-threatening risk. Whereas if you get a, um, a thrombosis or a type of blood clot in a deeper vein, so veins that provide right. blood flow through like the deep, deeper part of your system. So it'd be like the femoral artery, like the greater saphenous vein, the popliteal vein in your leg. Um, those are like clots there are a problem because they break off and they travel into the heart. So you either get like you have a heart attack or you have a um, pulmonary oh, embolism. Thank you. I was going to say a PE, a pulmonary embolism where you get a blood clot in your lungs. And so like I had that vein ablated, so I would not be at risk for getting a DVT in that leg. All because of a hematoma. Well, not really, but that yeah, was- Yeah, no, this is why, this is why you, everyone needs a friend who can cold hose their hematoma. Let's be clear, right. this was all because of a frisbee. Well, so I already had a diseased vein. I'd been to the doctor like a month or two before. Cause like, I, like my leg was really bothering me. And they said, okay, you, you, you've got a varicosity, like a varicose vein but you've got some like vein, vein, you've got some um, flow back issues. So basically when we're all standing upright, obviously blood is working against gravity to travel like up. Like if I'm standing, like blood goes down into my legs and then goes back, goes back up. And so the way that your blood is shunted back into your heart is that like, if, if you've got like your vein, within the vein, there are teeny little valves all along the vein that are just like little tick marks that are that kind of like open and close to help push blood back up. And if you have a diseased vein, these little valves don't close um, okay. entirely. And so it doesn't actually shunt blood back up to your heart. It pools in the legs. That's why people have like pain in their legs and they have blood pools in their legs. And so that is one of the ways that it leads, that, that is one of the mechanisms through which people get deep vein thrombosis. And so I had the beginning signs of that, but they weren't gonna do anything about it for a while. But then a da- I kicked a damn Frisbee because I'm an idiot. <laughs> is what it boils down to. And that that hit the diseased vein causing, I mean, the hematoma was literally was like one this vein big. That was diseased. One vein was diseased. Yeah, it was the greater saphenous vein. And so I hit, I kicked this Frisbee and it hit the top of my shin. Again, like just don't kick Frisbees kids. And the hematoma like literally like popped out of my shin like this. Like people across the field, I was like, oh, that doesn't look good. And everyone's like, oh God. It's fine, it's fine. And they're like, wait a second, like we can see this all the way across the field. I, I don't think this is fine. So I ended up That's going to ER fine. like two days later. That's bad. It was like good. one of the horses that I was cold hosing had tried to, actually that was my horse. And she had uh, tried to escape the trailer uh, while it was going 60 miles an hour and had almost died. Um, and even she did not have a hematoma visible from across the field. <laughs> Someone else in the comments got a hematoma from Ultimate Frisbee. What? This who are you? What? <laughs> Wait, who is it? Who is it? I want to talk to you. <laughs> you have an NF2. It oh is God. almost likely yeah, to Amber, occur. No, 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 no. Everyone pause. Everyone pause. Amritha is one of my best friends. In oh, cool. World. Okay, great. I love, I love Amritha so much. She is a brilliant, um, what is it? Uh, I think she's, I think the phrasing is psycholinguistic. She studies how people acquire, like develop their language skills. Oh, you actually really cool. need to have her on this because like- I will add her to the list. Because like she is legitimately brilliant and like her science is literally like, so apparent, I don't know the, I don't know how this happens, uh, but basically apparently dogs in some capacity are an analog for a certain stage of human language. <laughs> Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Yes. yes, I would love to learn about that. Please come it's, talk to us and really also incredible. share your Frisbee story. I know, but like she's also like a really great uh, intimate player, but additionally, her research is like dogs are some sort of analog for some sort of stage of for humans. That's and awesome. And she, so she's able to understand how children learn languages through, through doll. I don't, I don't know how it works, but um, it's really incredible. So yeah, no, that's Amber though. She's my best friend. She is awesome. She is the coolest person ever. Uh, so yes, you, sorry, sorry to derail this. No, no. it's good. This is what it's all about. 
Um, but you absolutely okay. need to have her on her own here. For the, so I think we should try to wrap up partially because it's Sunday. Um, I think for the last, let's say five minutes, do we want to do a lightning round of questions? And and also we need a little bit of time for Elliot's GoFundMe. Yes, yeah, yeah. So why don't we do that right now? So we have a list of resources in the like bibliography section of this video. Um, so Hanalar, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so I've got a wonderful friend, Elliot, who is uh, raising money to get top surgery for, you know, as a gender confirming surgery. Um, he's got until I think it's June 11th to raise the money. Um, the link is there. If you can donate one dollar, if you can donate five dollars, if you don't have to donate a huge amount, like just even one dollar, three dollars, five dollars, whatever, that would be incredible. He's a wonderful kid. I'm sorry, he's He's an adult, he's 20. I'm just, I'm 28, so I'm almost 29. So like everyone who is like younger than me, I'm like, oh, okay. but no, like he's a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, And yeah, it's just one of these things where it should be something that our healthcare system covers, but it doesn't. So if people could just kick in one or two or three or $5, that would be incredible. Um, So yeah, that's cool. I yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And the link is, I think, in the resources section of the video. So if you guys yes. can see it, that would be awesome. Um, yes. Okay. So, all right. I'm scrolling up. Ooh, while you're finding a question, I have a question. What are you reading right now? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, what, what was the what last book I... that you read? I understand grad school doesn't always make pro reading um, for fun prolific. So what was the last good book you read if you're not currently reading one? Okay. So... I'm actually currently reading uh, Touched by Fire, which okay. is a book about um, people with bipolar disorder who have done, you know, artistic and scientific cool. development because, um, you know, it's something that I actually live with. And it's something that, you know, historically Hollywood has turned into this really scary thing, but, nowadays we have like a way you know we have ways of catching up before it becomes something scary and so it becomes this way of being like hey like these things are not actually like it's not this horrible monster thing that like a hollywood movie makes it out to be it's so yeah uh that's actually what i've been reading it's not it's not fiction <laughs> but um yeah touch by fire uh it's great my okay. you know um so i think that's something that's really valuable and it's great because i think in general people you know, I don't want to try to make, I'm not trying to make light of the fact that like for a lot of people, their mental health struggles are just kind of unilaterally a bad thing. But I think also it's something that for me coming to peace with the differences in my brain and the things that are different in my brain also are what makes my brain, you know, good at certain things is something that's made it a lot easier to be at peace with. So that's awesome. something I really appreciate about it. So I have been reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> I honestly super get that vibe though. Like if I had my copies of Harry Potter with me here in Colorado rather than back in Maryland, I'd probably be rereading that in this fucking crisis situation. <laughs> How about you, Imogen? Uh, I'm reading, I'm reading uh, two books right now. Um, I just got a, I actually just bought a bunch of books. Um, I'm reading Lab Girl by Hope Jaren. Yeah. Uh, it's a science memoir. Um, I'm also reading cool. Ages for Hawk by Helen McKenzie. Um, I just got a book. So I just repurchased the book, The Handmaid, or not, sorry, not The Handmaid's Tale, The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd. Um, oh my God, I love that book. So that book much. changed my life when I was 15. So I figured I should read it right. like 18 no. years later. Like as a kid, I remember reading that and like my mom gave it to me and like I cried. It was one of the first books that I ever read that made me cry. And it's just like, it's incredible. Um, it's a really great book. I recommend everybody read it. It's, it's like a coming of age novel for young people um, or for, I guess, young women, but it's like a great look at, you know, a young person growing up in the South in like the 60s, 50s, 60s yeah. and looking at like what racism, it's not looking at what racism actually is for people who experience it is a recurring theme in the book, um, but it's not the only theme. And there's a lot of interesting coming of age, like and navigating processing. yourself in the world. And processing familial trauma. Processing also, trauma and dealing with grief yeah. is a really, it's, really interesting it's a, book. It's a beautiful book. 
it's yeah. a like I super co-signed. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's awesome. No, that's um, a good book. Yeah, I'm trying okay. to, to read all the. I bought a couple, bunch of uh, other books, um, but I I literally just like bought a bunch of books, but I don't have all the titles memorized because I just sort of was like click 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 click. <laughs> Birthday boy, by the way. Oh, oh baby. Well, he you know did a lot of talking about science, but also barking. So now he's tired. <laughs> yeah. He's like, well, that was actually Sven. Oh, whoops. Sven's Sorry, the, buddy. Sven's the one who barks. Don't don't besmirch tears, beautiful man. <laughs> Um, let's Tears see what... a good boy. Tears a very good okay. boy. So, questions, yeah. If something falls, if something falls into a black hole, where does it go? Um, so there are there's a couple ways to interpret the, this question. So the way I interpret this as someone who doesn't study the interiors of black holes, as I say. It gets ripped apart and all you can learn from all that remains of it is its mass, its angular momentum, and its charge. Though the astrophysical black holes we observe don't have charge. So basically just its mass and its angular momentum. When you actually ask what does all that other information go into, that's a super active area of research because we don't actually know how to make the information theory work. Um, because right now we're basically at a place where either you can conserve information or you can make sense of the information theory side of it, or you can preserve what's called the equivalence principle, which is something that basically says falling in a, gravita falling in a gravitational field is exactly the same as accelerating under a force. Um, free falling under gravity, like under gravity is the, is the same. Um, and so, that's actually a really profound question that we don't totally know the answer to. What I will say is all that we can, know, all that we can, the only information we can extract from something that's fallen into a black hole is its mass, its angular momentum, and its charge. Though, keep in mind that the charge is generally something that doesn't exist in it's astrophysical like black holes. Is magnetic charge or like what is that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, electromagnetic charge. Okay, so if there was like a positively charged black mm -hmm. hole, negatively charged black hole, would they attract? Probably, but we've never we've never observed that. I did so. not know that. That's cool. No, I, yeah, all of the astrophysical black holes that we see basically have zero net charge, which to some extent makes sense because these are plasmas, and you rip every like what they're creating is plasmas. Every like all the charge is basically ripped off of them, you know. So um, here's, here's a question kind of sort of along those veins. If what happens when black holes merge? They ask, is it literally like bubbles converging? So sort of, that's a really good way of visualizing it. I love there's, it. That's a wonderful way of visualizing it. So there's like a specific way that they circle each other and then have this ring down when they're getting closer and closer together, which we can actually detect using LIGO. Uh, which is the Laser Interferometry Gravity uh, Observatory, um, which has two sites in the United States, uh, in Washington and in Louisiana. And there's also Virgo in Italy, I believe, um, which is now online. So we can observe the gravitational waves and we can get some more information. But yes, if you want to visualize it, it's kind of like these two bubbles and then they, and they don't, but the one thing is, is that some amount of the, so if you have two, like 10 solar mass black holes, the resultant black hole of their merger is not gonna be 20 solar masses. It will okay. lose some amount of mass from the gravitational radiation. Cause again, remember when you're dealing with relativistic cases, mass and energy, same thing. So mm. um, your gravitational radiation is carrying away some of what would have been the mass for that merger. Okay. So it's like something like, you know, it would be something like 18 or 19 solar masses or something like that. Um, and then there'd be some amount of a solar mass, some amount of solar masses carried away in gravitational nice. radiation. That's really cool. I know. Um, I am scrolling up. Someone um, said in the comments, let, uh, they just want to say how cool it is to see a scientist with tattoos. Hell yeah. <laughs> Oilers identity. That's amazing. My favorite creation <laughs> of all time. I know, me too. <laughs> yeah, um, no. 
Okay, if black holes consume matter, how do they react to dark matter? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, naively, I think they should just swallow it. But here's the thing is that what's interesting, so because it's okay if I take like a moment to explain dark matter a little bit. Yes, please. So what's super creepy about dark matter. So dark matter is actually not as, hey, Sven, can you please calm down? I know you love dark matter, but you need to be quiet so that other people can hear things about dark matter. Um, <laughs> So what's super creepy about dark matter is that it's actually not as crazy as it sounds. All that dark matter is, is it's matter that doesn't interact electromagnetically, which is why we don't see it. It's not luminous, but fun fact, electromagnetism is why shit doesn't pass through each other. That's called the normal force. So like the reason why my butt isn't going through my like couch right now is because of the normal force. It's because of like electrons like pushing against each other. Um, it's real. To keep that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find it. Yes. But no, it's real though. And so what's super, super groovy about dark matter is it can pass through shit. And she'll, whoop. like my hands are not passing through each other because of the normal force. But if I just was made of dark, well, you can see me if I was made of dark matter because our eyes evolved to only see electromagnet, like electromagnetic radiation. But if I was made of dark matter, my hands could go whoosh through each other. I feel um, like drunk people all over the world are sitting there doing like, whoa. You could. Like it's super, Sven, please calm down. I know that you absolutely love discussions of dark matter, but you need to be quiet. Um, <laughs> no, but so like the thing is, is that it would be really interesting to see how dark matter would uh, affect the accretion disk because if there was a significant amount of dark matter, it should shape like how the accretion disk self-gravity works and like gravitational potential and all that, but it wouldn't interact electromagnetically. So it just sort of passed through everything only having a gravitational impact. So dark matter that was accreted onto a black hole would just impact its mass and probably angular momentum. Cool. Are most black holes rotating black holes? Um, I don't know of any that have literally zero spin, uh, literally zero rotation. Um, some are not highly rotating. Some are some are really highly rotating. But you know, honestly, it also might be the fact that rotation is part of what can launch the jets that we see off of these suckers. So it might just be that it's hard to see black holes that have zero rotation. So what we see is they, they have rotation. Um, Got it. What, last, last question from me, um, what did you think of Interstellar's depiction of black holes? That's a little bit of a weird question for me because like I was actually in um, the research group that kind of was like started by Kip Thorne. So I actually do know to some extent Kip Thorne and I tried to hassle him about black holes and he had no interest in talking to me about black holes. <laughs> um, so I think that the simulation of what happens to light around a black hole was quite good. That was quite good. Um, if you were on a planet <clears throat> that would have the tidal forces that had the subsequent like time effects that were shown in the movie, you would be ripped apart. You would not, you would die. You would, you would not live. You would be dead. Uh, <laughs> so it's interesting because like the movie had this juxtaposition of research quality work against stuff that was just like, no. That's a, good, that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. So like, the simulations of Gargantua were research quality. You know, like it was, that was, that was exceptional theoretical work. Yeah. But a lot of these plot points of like, oh, like we go on this planet with the tidal forces, like you would be ripped apart. You would die. Yeah. You would be dead. You would not be a human anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when people ask me like, how do you feel about the science of interstellar? I'm like, overall bad. But a very specific thing was good. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay, cool. Imogene, do you have one last question or anything you want to say? Yeah, one last question. If you were working in a different branch of science that was not, not what you're currently doing, what would it be? Neuroscience. Absolutely neuroscience. neuroscience. Nice. Absolutely okay. fascinated by neuroscience. I think it's incredible. Actually, again, not to like harp on this point too much, but my uh, very, very dear friend, one of my best friends in the world, Amrissa, the ultimate Frisbee player, um, study neuroscience. Uh, I've got a few other friends who have studied neuroscience. I think it's absolutely fascinating um, cool. how people's brains work is, is incredible. So if I were Wonderful. not doing astrophysics, I would probably be doing neuroscience. That's yeah. awesome. I feel like as someone who doesn't know much about either of those fields, I feel like that they're not terribly dissimilar based on all the photos I've seen of like our brains firing and yeah. stars and no, galaxies. I mean, so it's information theory. It's a lot of, a right. lot of the neuroscience research that I'm aware of is a lot of information theory, yeah. which black holes are the most efficient information scramblers in the universe. That's one definition of a black hole. That's really um, cool. I just realized is probably not super useful for anyone that isn't a scientist, but I think it's a super groovy fact about them. No, that's um, really cool. That's cool. I know. I love them. I love them. <laughs> it's super good. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Hanwar, thank you so much for being a guest. Imogen, thank you. Friend slash co-host I can never want. Um, if you guys want to follow our wonderful guest, please go to the com or the description, whatever it's called. Um, also, Elliot's GoFundMe link is now in the description. There was uh, technical difficulties because apparently tonight's technical thing was terrible. My bad. Um, but it's there now. So please go donate if you can. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. This was so much fun. And we will be back next time. Thank you. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, everyone. Okay. I think the stream has ended. Thank you guys. I am so sorry that it took a 30 minute intro. It's all good. No, no, no. It is all good. And I have to be honest,